I'm going to take this crowd live right now. All right, let's see. I'm going to hit the go live button, but it always rewinds a few seconds back. So you're probably going to hear me saying goodbye there to Sean and Blake as we're about to go live together. I don't know why I'm playing with a lint roller. I'll put that away now. I don't need any visual aids of the Milky Way with that at the moment. But hey to Jerry and hey to Chris. Chris says <laughs> he's here to support his oh support me. That's true, me and his friend Blake. And so apparently Chris and Blake were out in mono, and I guess only now Chris Woodruff is processing those panos from there. So well done, Chris. Get those taken care of. And hey to Jerry, welcome in. So in the background, I have Blake and Sean ready to go. Clarence had a family emergency where his, well, things happened that he has to go take care of right away and then can drive back home to the studio. So he'll be joining us possibly right away or midstream, but we'll get to Clarence's questions and stuff as soon as he gets in. So we'll have plenty of time with him. Kathy's here. Cheryl's here. Welcome in. Hey, hey. So if you guys can help me out, Chris, Jerry, Kathy, and Cheryl, we want to get some more people listening to these guys' information on Deep Sky. So if you can go to your Facebook and just share the link from this YouTube page, just say, hey, right now we're live over at Milky Way Wednesday. We're doing a Deep Sky Astro Roundtable, and Clarence Spencer Sean Maloney and Blake Fair are here, so just let them know that there, there is going to be some learning going on over here. So I hope that you guys want to get them in here, help us uh, get some more people. Uh, let's see, behind the screen where Blake is is my Photoshop. Let me turn that down. So I'm listening to myself, talk to myself. Okay, looks like the audio is working okay there. I got this clip working fine, but now I want to get that other one, that one that I was so liking. But where was it? Hmm, so I'm realizing here in the final minutes before we go live that I have a graphic that's a little lower screen banner that I can use to introduce these guys. And I'm thinking about putting it for the first time on all of their faces on the Zoom call. And I think that'll be kind of nice. And so what I should do is I should turn my phone volume down so I don't hear any more notifications. <laughs> Bob Burkowski's here. Monday was the second full moon in a row where I got clouded out. Maybe July with a charm. I think it was the super moon too, Bob. You missed the, the perigee of the moon. Uh, photo tours Peru. Hello, Aaron. Hello, faster, right? Because Peru is faster. I think that's the same, one and the same. But photo tours Peru might be another Peruvian, and faster is also from Peru. I can't remember, but welcome in. And Rhonda's here. Good evening, everybody. Awesome. Welcome in. We're getting started. We're going to go live at about six minutes. And I'm doing what I do every week and having an epiphany last minute that causes me to do Photoshop editing on the fly. So I'm going to work on that for the next five minutes. And I'm going to leave you all with this. No. The time lapse is interesting. Maybe I'll change the time lapse so it isn't just constantly, constantly playing this one. But enjoy. Oh, it's underneath everything. I need to put it on top now. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, I see what's happening because I have to click this button. There we go. Yes, Photo Tours is from Cusco. Awesome. And Matthew Costanza is here. Looking for the World Oregon Workshop. Hey, Matt, I did see an email that came in from you asking about the workshop. I'm going to get back to you. Sorry that I was too busy to do it already. But I'm so stoked. It is going to be a blast. And also driving towards the worst of the weather. I mean the weather. The, the price in oil. Oh, my gosh. Gas prices get worse every state I go back up to Oregon. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Kathy. Okay, shared one on Facebook. Thanks, Kathy. I was asking Kathy to uh, share for us um, the link. So right now we're live here on YouTube. If you could help us out, get more people listening in and hanging out with us, just click on the share button, go over to your Facebook page and say, hey, my buddies, Blake Fair, Clarence Spencer, Sean Maloney, and Aaron King are talking Deep Sky Astro. If you want to do some learning with us, come join us. Mark Moore. Hey, welcome in, Mark. And Lauren, see you. Did you see that part in my pre-recorded video where I mentioned you, Lorenzo? I did. Sup, y'all. Sup, sup, sup. Good evening, Jim. Welcome in. Oh, yeah, I got to get back to my epiphany moment of I'm going to add this thing last minute. 
Okay, let's open up the other file and make this faster. I think I'm going to do. Here, I'll stop commentating on what I'm doing and let you listen to this video, and I'm going to change it here in a second. Oh, the array is a smaller video and it's revealing me. <gasps> okay, got it out of the way. So I've got just about two minutes to pull this off. <sighs> it's not that hard, but getting everything that I want all right there and duplicating it and then piecing them together separately. Okay, and then I'm going to bring over the face of Sean. Do, 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 do. If you're just joining us right now, we're going live here in about two minutes, and we will have Clarence joining us a little late as he had a family emergency take him away from the studio, but he's ready to go, and I've got lots of stuff here to talk about with everybody, and we're going to be plenty busy asking questions of Sean and Blake in the beginning, and most likely I'll be adding, the, adding this little feature that I'm doing right now um, after as they are talking about their gear because that'll take at least 400 minutes each so we'll be fine <laughs> Blake claims that his will be a lot shorter than Sean's <laughs> Sean says you never know <laughs> all right we're counting down a final minute before we go live uh Lorenzo says yes he's seen it it made me smile yes <laughs> uh Kathy goes Bob I got hit with the monster thunderstorm just in time for the moonrise oh man isn't that fantastic and Bob says Kathy how was the thunderstorm and any lightning and Kathy says her drone is supposed to arrive tomorrow oh that's not answering Bob's question but uh she's saying also that she's getting a drone and she gets a month to test it out before going to the pharaohs and and that uh, worst lightning in years here, over 500 an hour. Wow, that is very crazy. All right, looks like we're about to go live. I will turn off the live opener video and let you guys just look at me while I get ready to show you me very big. So let's see. Uh, thinking, Aaron's thinking right now. Oh yeah, I wanna group all four of these and do the bump 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 and call that Sean and then turn it off and on. Oh, I must have missed something. Photo credit. Let's turn off all of that. Oh, I see. Maybe now it's working. I didn't miss it. Woo! -hoo! I have something going. It might just, just, just might work. All right. So we're gonna go live here any second. We're gonna start Milky Way Wednesday. Who's ready? Who's ready to join me? Let's do this. Let's get ready. The timer is done. Let's kick it off. And welcome in. I'm wearing headphones because I'm going to be listening to Sean and Blake and Clarence while we're talking. And you'll all be hearing him coming right through the live stream, joining me here in the Zoom call. Thanks so much for joining me on yet another Milky Way Wednesday. And tonight's Milky Way Wednesday is going to be just a little bit different as we kind of ignore the Milky Way for a moment. Say, hey, Milky Way. Take a back seat. I know it's June and it's our last month for Panorama and it's a wonderful time of the year for Milky Way, but we're going to ignore it and look past, literally 
well, not really literally past the Milky Way. Some of these deep sky objects are still in the Milky Way, and so it's not looking beyond the Milky Way to see them. But if you look at the Andromeda Galaxy, for instance, that is a deep sky object that is outside the Milky Way. So it'll be fun to talk with these three experts and beginning expert in Blake, who is who has a knowledge in something that it seems to be the progression of all Milky Way photographers. Hey, I got a camera. I can see the Milky Way. Woohoo, Milky Way looks good. Oh, now my foreground in Milky Way. Let's work on that. Mm, my foreground in Milky Way looks amazing. Okay, now I want to do a panorama. Now I want to do stacking. Now I want to do a dual exposure panorama. Now I'm kind of bored and I'm going to do tracking. I'm going to put my camera on a tracker, move it with the stars so that I have extra work to do over in Photoshop. That is the life of a Milky Way photographer, it seems. And then when they get to that point where they've done years of that, they start dreaming about close-up shots of deep sky objects like the Rosette Nebula. I have a bunch of pictures that I'm realizing I haven't put on the screen yet, so I'll also do that while I introduce my guests, the two that are with me right now. I have with me, oh, I gotta hide Photoshop. Okay, move Photoshop over here, la 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 la. Then I gotta make sure Zoom is big. And okay, Zoom is big. I'm coming in to introduce my guests, Blake Fair and Sean Maloney. Hey, you Blake and Sean, welcome in. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> so on the right on my screen is Sean Maloney. Sean, where, tell us where you're from and give us just a quick feedback on you know what you did to get started into this and how long you've been doing it. Just the one minute, two minute elevator pitch of how you got into Astro. I, uh, well, I live in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which is about oh, 40 miles north of New Orleans. And I live in a Bortle 8 to 9 sky. Uh, it's pretty bright out here. I started about six years ago, and uh, I went outside with my camera and a tripod and tried to shoot a picture of the uh, Orion Nebula, because Orion was up. And uh, I kept doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it. And finally, I got this little teeny tiny picture in focus of Orion, and that's all it took. I was hooked. <laughs> and, uh, then I started learning. I, I knew nothing about it. I had I used YouTube solely to just start learning everything that I could about it and getting equipment, buying the wrong equipment, selling equipment, buying the wrong equipment, over and over again until I finally got an understanding of how to do it all. And then I started branching out and started shooting actual nebulas and, and large deep space objects. And now I'm six years into it and um, you know, just trying to refine my talents at this point. Awesome. You have fantastic photography. In fact, everyone might recognize the similarities between the image that's behind Sean on his right versus over here on my full screen. If I transition over here and show, oh, my backside is blocking it. It's on this side. This image right here comes from Sean. And... <laughs> oh. Yeah, it's glorious to see this. Oh, you know what? I just realized that possibly when I show the, without showing the screen, I might not get the desktop audio. So tell us again what was in that image. I think I blocked your audio from being there. Nebula, and it is called the Pelican Nebula. And uh, I use a, a CCD QSI 690 camera, which is you know very small pixels, and it zooms in a lot with this RCA scope that I have. So it's just a little piece of the giant North American nebula. Um, but the colors and the blue oxygen and the sulfurs and the hydrogen alpha is so gorgeous in it that I just I, I couldn't just not take it. And so it lives <laughs> just below Cygnus, and there's there's a ton ton of uh, deep space objects coming up in the north right now. There's a there's a bunch in the south, but a, a big wide share are, are hanging right there in the north and they're finally coming up at a reasonable hour to shoot them. <laughs> yes. And now I'm gonna bring in Blake and feature you, Blake. Uh, oh, replace Spotlight, I think that's what you do. Hey, there's Blake there Fair. He is. There he is, well, not that red. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to you from the pits of hell. Why are you so bright red? Sorry that I have all the coloring so funny on the camera right now. But this is Blake. Blake, 
Tell us your adventure. We all seen your photography recently, your Mono Lake panorama, the one right there with the beautiful, beautiful arch going over Mono Lake. They might remember that I mentioned Blake Fair there. This is the man himself. You've <laughs> been doing Milky Way photography for a long time now. How long ago did you get into the telescope gear that's sitting to your right? Six months. So I am so much less experienced than, uh, than Sean. Um, it works beautiful. I transitioned basically from, um, like everybody else, you, you know, first time you get the Milky Way, it's all, it's great. Then you went better and better and end up tracking and doing dual exposure and all that stuff. And, uh, the deep sky stuff intrigued me. Um, and I kind of very rapidly went through the, doing it with the DLSR. Um, it just wasn't, I felt like I was wasting a lot of time trying to get what I wanted. So what I wanted was beautiful pictures, obviously. And so I think now I've gotten to kind of a minimum level for that, especially I live in Oceanside. Um, the Bortle, a thousand, I don't know. It's, <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> it's like light, it light, light, <laughs> light. Um, and uh, so that has affected some of my decisions, which I guess we'll talk about. Cool. But, uh, yeah, I'm kind of at the, where I can take pictures that I like and work from there. So, all right, me. perfect. Well, let's let you start the show as this will be the more accessible version for all of us who are transitioning <laughs> into this. And so when you think about a noob's perspective, help us understand the gear that you have there and feel free if you need to move any of it. I'm sure that mount is too heavy for you to move anything into view, huh? That's going to stay. I could scoot it across the floor. It's no big deal. Yeah, let's try it. Go go yeah. for it. Let's try it real quick. And while you do that, I'll talk to the chat room. So, hey, everybody. It looks like Kathy's mom's joining us tonight. So, hey, Kathy's mom from Aaron King. Hey, welcome in. I am going to be playing around with audio and fixing stuff all in the background to make this live stream go. As you, If you're familiar with me doing the live stream, you know that I'm kind of one man banding this on the side. So, I'm looking here, looking there. got three different monitors that I'm running everything with. So, be patient with me to help me make sure we don't miss any of your questions that you would like to interject with make sure you put them in all caps so right here in the chat as i'm watching it over here on my screen give me your question in all caps so that i can say hey blake real quick you know lorenzi was asking this question or hey you know what well, real quick uh, sean what did you say cheryl was asking about that narrow band stuff because she has a great house and a good i think it's a summer home cheryl right a summer home that you got over there that had a good view of orion but i don't know how light polluted it is and maybe it's a perfect location to narrow band for eight hours a night out there so <laughs> I'm going to interrupt them constantly with these questions. And so hit me up, all caps, as soon as you thought of it, hit it out there, and I will keep an eye on it. And Kirk will help me probably keep track of it because Kirk's joined me and he's main part of the Photog Adventures team. So, all right, let's go and see what Blake has over here on the screen. All right, so I like the view of this. So can you run through the five minute introduction to all the yeah. gear necessary to make that happen. And the images you shared with me recently, were they all captured with that setup or a different one? Uh, most of them. I, I, I can explain as I go along though. Okay, cool. Go for it. First thing I did was because I never want to get on my knees and pull a line again. <laughs> the ASI air, which is a, a controller. Um, instead of using a laptop out in the field, you can just use your phone or a laptop. Okay. Um, Control your mount and your camera. Um, I got that, and the mount was the only one I could find available. I mean, there's nothing available right now. Um, it's an Orion Sirius. It's not a great mount, but it's a good entry level mount. Um, and it, I mean, it's so far it served me pretty well. Um, and then I moved, I was using a DLSR and a zoom lens. Wasn't all that happy with that. So I went, moved up to the telescope, um, which is a uh, uh, Williams Optics. Uh, GT71, which is relatively wide field, um, about 400 something millimeters equivalent. Um, I put a field flattener on it, so it's about 330. So it's not huge reach. But most of the things we're taking pictures of right now, I am anyway, are big. A lot of the emission nebulas are, are very large. So it, it works for my level of expertise. It's also more forgiving for things like 
uh, tracking and things like that. So uh, then uh, you switched from a zoom lens that was just a nice DSLR zoom lens that had good yeah. reach and you were succeeded yeah. with that real quick. What was the reason that you were needing to transition? What were you lacking the most? I wasn't, I wasn't happy with what I was getting. Um, Fuzzy, just, not clear. Yeah, yeah, it just wasn't wasn't clear. I mean, if you look at Sean's pictures, obviously that's everyone whole. <laughs> and I was so far away from that 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 it just wasn't working. Um, I have an Astro modified by Spencer's camera. He shows up. Uh, <laughs> DLSR, and that helped, but um, just wasn't what I was looking for. I want something eventually that I can put on my wall and be proud of, you know. Um, so I have a neighbor, luckily. Adam, if you ever listen to this, thank you. <laughs> thank uh, you, Adam. Yeah, who lent me a, a, a one-shot color camera um, and um, Optolong uh, Extreme Pro filter for the, the light pollution here in Oceanside. Um, that helped quite a bit. Um, I started to get pictures I liked. As a matter of fact, uh, I think you have my Rosette Nebula somewhere. I don't know if you have it available. But that was with a one-shot color camera. Yeah, let me pull it up while you keep saying that. I just realized I didn't have those pulled off to the side where it's easy accessible. So keep talking and I'll grab it. That's okay. And and then I had to make a decision and it's everybody's decision on you know, where they live and what light conditions they have. But where I am, the one shot color camera is a compromise. It makes it hard uh, because of all the light pollution. So I ended up going with a mono camera um, and narrow band filters. Um, <laughs> This is all in six months, so it was a lot of learning very quickly. Uh, mono camera with uh, narrow band filters. Um, they had a good deal on the uh, ZWO, the ASI 1600 uh, mono camera. Not the perfect camera, but for what I'm doing, it's awesome. So um, then looking at just the gear that you have there, just so that we don't get too lost in the weeds of different gear names. Yeah. Can you identify the necessity, the purpose, and items that are all right there? Like, what's the camera? What's the lens? What's the tracker? Stuff like that. I'll just go need that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that is, you said was what? What? What one? It was from uh, William Warren Optics. Optic. Yeah, DT seventy one. DT is in dog. DT, 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 G like golf. That. Okay, golf tango. All right. And it's not. I mean. Yes, the stuff's expensive, but it was about eleven hundred dollars. That's Not still a lens cost, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, on top is a guide camera, um, which is uh, it's a one twenty. This part's one hundred twenty millimeters. This part's just a um, uh, DWO mini guide camera. I don't even know the name of it specifically. This is the ASI Air. Real quick before you leave the guide camera, sure. explain the, for those uninitiated why a guide camera. What's that? What a guide camera does is it follow. It's a wider angle camera than your telescope, and it follows a star. It through software it picks a star and sends micro impulses to your mount to make to allow you to guide better, um, to allow the mount to make micro adjustments as it's as it's moving, so you can get longer exposures. Um, with obviously no star trailing or star bloat, which it happens. Aye, okay. Um, How then, hard is it for that to get set up? I mean, are you supposed it, to align it? It's really not, as far as setting up the whole thing. Just uh, the guiding scope. Like you're thinking well, the scope, that versus yeah, a tracker. It's, it's really easy. easy. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the thing with the tracker, everybody has a hard time with is polar alignment. And with the ASI Air, and the mount, it's you just do it in software. You it'll tell you you're to the left a little bit too much and up a little bit too much, and you just use the uh, screws on the bottom, screws on the bottom of the mount, move it a little bit, refresh, move it a little bit, refresh. Takes about five minutes. How does it communicate to you the in directions like that? On your phone. Oh. Phone or your iPad. Um, it produces a Wi-Fi network, and you join that, and everything you do, you can see on your phone. Okay. Wow. Okay. Everything you're doing, yeah. Previews of everything you're doing. You can see the guiding. You can see everything, which is, I, I, people that are really into it, I think, are not that thrilled with it because it makes it easy. <laughs> I, don't have to have a laptop. I don't have to have a laptop out there. I like easy. Nice. <laughs> but it, but hey, it works. Um, and then this is the filter wheel, and that's the camera. The camera on the back, which has a cooling cooling system. Uh, to cool it down so you don't have to worry about hot pixels and that. Um, but that it's it seems complicated, 
but I've used it enough times now. It's actually pretty simple. I can set the whole thing up in about 15 minutes, um, which means it's portable for me. I can take it with me several times this year while I've been doing Milky Way, set this up and have it doing deep sky stuff at the same time. Okay. So I interrupted you as you were going down the gear list. So let's just re yeah. let's just summarize it real quick. Point to the telescope and the gear as I pointed. So there's the telescope. Yeah. Yeah. How, how long is it? The black part included as a telescope? Well, yeah, it, go, it goes actually from here to here. Okay. And it's then... Field flattener, which is just something you need on the end of your telescope. It's a what? Field flattener. Oh, a field flattener. It makes it so the stars are pinpoint to the edges of your, your, your photo. Oh, okay. And it also um, makes the lens a little bit faster. So uh, then it's connected to... I can probably explain that better than I can. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, we'll let Sean tackle that when we get on his gear. Yeah. So then you also have a wheel there. It's hard to tell from this perspective, but I know that it's a wheel that's shifting in um, it filters. Just, yeah, it turns. And because I'm shooting narrow band, um, I have narrow band filters. And it shoots hydrogen alpha, um, oxygen, and sulfur. Um, it can also shoot other things, but that's what I mainly use. Um, it does all those things increase um the time you spend out there taking pictures um it's not three times as much but it 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 is more so you're taking a, a, a subject um i'll take like an hour of each one at a time and just to clarify for everyone what he's saying is that there are what three filters in there three color filters or yeah. four yeah. three so he well, has to take a picture with one filter and then capture it for an hour then he switches to the next color filter, capture it for an hour, and then switches to a third one and captures it for an hour. Yeah. So while um, Sean and Clarence are speaking, would you be able to, Blake, to show us some of the raws of each color wheel to show kind of like what you get back? Would that be something um, on this computer at all? Probably not, huh? It's, it's not, not on no. this computer. Okay. No, on my main computer, we'll sorry. save that for a future episode of Milky Way Wednesday. Yeah. So yeah. then that filter wheel is connected to then that red a box at the red circle at the end of the yeah, cylinder. Yeah. That's, that's the camera. Is that a cooling itself camera? Does it have yes. its own cooling on it? Okay. Yes, it does. Yes, so it does. a CCD is what they call yeah. it. So then all in all, your camera is the red cylinder at the back. You have a filter mm -hmm. wheel, a telescope with a flattener attached to it all the mm -hmm. way through the end. Your mount is holding that. And to keep you aligned, instead of having to go on your belly to get underneath there and point the laser at North Star, you've actually <laughs> got that guiding scope at the top connected to a box. And that will actually communicate with your phone and say if you're on or off. Yeah, that'll, that'll, the phone will tell me everything about my imaging session. Okay. Uh, Previews, it'll give me how the tracking is doing. Um, I can set up a plan and do different target. It, it's it's very advanced, um, more advanced than I am. I'm still learning, obviously. <laughs> uh, but it's amazing you can do all that on your phone to me. Yeah, uh, honestly. I have a, not to have to have a laptop, though. And I love that it has a little Wi-Fi signal that it'll send to you so you don't have to worry yeah. about how to connect to that picture. So yeah. this is the round table, and I'll be gumping around back and forth. And so the last <laughs> question for you on this part before we come back to you is going to be about that entire setup right there. Steve has to ask, and I'm curious as well, how much, may we know, did that cost? Uh, I probably should have added it up, but I haven't, so I can just kind of go part by part. <laughs> So we'll start doing our own calculators yeah, here. Do your own, yeah, I don't I'm going to pull know. up my phone. Don't tell you and don't tell your wife. I don't want to know the answer. <laughs> Certainly don't tell my wife the answer. <laughs> she, okay, um, let's start with the telescope. Telescope's about 1100 If you go for a one-shot color camera, you don't have to have the filter wheel and the filters, um, which is probably a better way to start. I was lucky to borrow a color camera and then decide. So anyway. Okay. The one shot color camera, you can do it for about a thousand dollars. Um, you don't need the filter wheel if you do that. The ASI Air is about four hundred dollars, I think, three to four now, if you can find one. Okay. Um, the guide camera, one hundred and twenty dollars, not much, and the mount about fifteen hundred. Okay. Do you want to know or no? 
Sure. Okay, plug your ears if you don't know. All right, that added up to be 4,125. That's about what I thought. <laughs> so when it comes to the reality of jumping into this aspect of photography, we're not saying ditch your $6,000 worth of gear and now buy $30,000 worth of gear. Not yet. At 4,000, as crazy as it, as it might sound, that's manageable. That's a new DLSR. Right. Do you want to buy the next camera body or yeah. do you want to get into deep sky astro? And when, this, this is a good starting point. Okay, cool. Well, since we're still on the gear topic, I'm going to bring in Sean and have him go through his gear. Now, we had a really good um, situation with Blake's gear where we could go through one piece by piece, and you have multiple pieces of gear, Sean. So I am going to lean on you to give us the rundown of what you can in the same amount of time that Blake used for his one piece of gear. Because no Blake, Blake gave us the deep in, and now I'm ready for just a shallow deep, shallow dive since... Uh, I asked a lot of good questions to Blake, and so it went really well with Blake. So I hope we didn't take up too much of your time, Sean, because your gear no, no, looks no. like the Ghostbusters are about to attack some evil demons from the other side. Blake, I have uh, two GT71s. I love that scope. <laughs> I've had it for years, so uh, keep that scope. Don't let it go. Um, I have two different setups. Um, I have this primarily a mono CCD uh, person for shooting. So... so I'm using I'm using uh, filters for everything because of my light pollution out here so bad I don't even mess with one shot color. That's why I can't shoot Milky Ways out here. You can't see it. <laughs> um, but I did want to jump back real quick if you don't mind because the yeah to please the gui to the guiding. Okay, um, there's a couple. Of, the reason that you guide is that your your mount will track on its own. For you know, if you want to put an eyepiece in and you set it up and align it, you know, you go through the alignment process, it'll keep your target within, you know, a pretty good range to where you and the family can look through your eyepieces and follow along with that target for as long as you want. But if you want to photograph it, you got to keep it, I keep mine within 50 pixels at all times. And all of my exposures are 20 minutes. So each night I'll shoot about 18, 20 minute shots on one filter. And what the guiding does is it picks off a star. And, and Blake's exactly right. What it does is it picks a star near what you're shooting. And so since your mount's already tracking and you have aligned it to Polaris and gotten a good polar alignment on it before you even started all this, it watches that star. And anytime that it takes a picture, programmably, however much you set it for, one, two, three seconds, whatever. But each time it takes a picture, it says, oh, look, if the star moved you know, this much to the left. And so it sends a command to the mount and says, go this way that much. And so you're const it's constantly sending those commands over and over again to keep your, 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 your telescope pointed at that target for however you program it, mine 50 pixels. But there's two kinds of, uh, of ways to guide. And what Blake is using is a guide scope. And I use those for years and years and years. And that's where you mount a separate scope on top of your, your rig. And you use that scope separately from your telescope to watch that scar. Okay. Because that's what, something I have too. But you've used something different than a guide scope now. I use what's called an off-axis guide. And that's what this camera is. And what it does is it slides down into the top of your camera itself. And it's got a little mirror. And it picks off a tiny bit of the light coming from the telescope and sends oh. it up into the camera. And that way, there's a thing called flexure. Uh, when you put another scope on top of it and use it as a guide scope, if it's not torqued just right, you can get what's called flexure. And it can show up in your images. How but, would flexors show up in your image as just an aberration of a warping or? Yeah, kind of a warping or some of your stars might be off on one side of the, uh, of the, uh, the uh, image. Okay. Um, there's a bunch of ways, but it's basically, a, it's just off a little bit and it shows up. Uh, I never had a problem with flexure on guide scope, but hmm. it takes a piece of equipment off my scope, less weight, and, and you have a much better... Uh, guiding system than what you have with the guide scope but okay. either one works either one works but i just prefer the off-axis guide um, how long have you been using the off-axis guide scope that's that blue one connected to your about camera three years 
And so, so you can speak to its success at being better. Um, what's the con of going that direction? Just cost? Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, it just depends. I mean, like like he showed you the uh, guide scope that he has. They're about that little mini from ASI. It's about 150 bucks. It's not expensive. It's a great guide scope. I had one okay. on my, uh, you know, and, and some of my best pictures were shot with guide scopes. Um, it's about half and half right now. Now on this new rig I have right here, you can't really see it, but this, this is, is amazing rig. Just looking at that, <laughs> I feel like you're going up into space and you're going to fight off the invaders. <laughs> well, this is a CCD camera, charge coupling device. This is what the old technology was, which I still love. Okay. Um, the new systems are going, and, and ASI and ZWO is taking over the market, but they're going with CMOS, which is with the same sensor that you find in your DSLR cameras. Um, and that's what this is. And I have a filter wheel, but except that the only difference between me and Blake is I have an off-axis guide on it instead of a guide scope. I had a guide scope on it, but I, I took it off and put the off-axis guide on But otherwise, this little section of my scope is really no different than what Blake has on his GT7. Oh, okay. So... Uh, you had also mentioned the uh, flattener on the back of the, the draw tube from the focuser. Yeah. Um, flatteners don't typically reduce your your uh, your imaging time. It's reducers that do it. So you can buy what's called a reducer, a reducer flattener, or a flattener. So mm -hmm. if you buy a flattener and you're shooting F7, you're going to shoot F7 on the flat. But if you buy a reducer, say like 0.08, X, it's going to reduce it by 0.08. Then you have to do a little calculation, and that will reduce your shooting time because it, it, it changes your f stop to a wider f stop. They, in, in the astro world, they call this a uh, faster telescope, and I always laugh at it because really all it is is an f stop. <laughs> and uh, when I bring it up, they just look at me, what's an f stop? But <laughs> you're just going from F7 to F4 or whatever the calculation brings you to when you put that reducer on. So Blake's got it right. You know, that, that's what you do it for. And when you reduce a GT71, you're going to get a, a much faster, faster, a much lower F-stop than what you're going to get without the reducer on it. So, and the okay. flattener does exactly what it says. It flattens the field all the way across the board so that you don't have coma, or anything like that on the edges of the field of your, of your camera. Now, since we're going to, I'm just going to put this to the side since you wanted to talk about what this is. This is the Richie Crichton RC telescope. It is made for photography only. Um, if you, I don't know if you can see inside, no, you can't, but Not you can yet, kind of no. see right here, there's baffles that break up the light inside back to the mirror Interesting. so that you so that you don't get it's actually the exact same scope that the Hubble is except just a much reduced scale but uh what I did was you know it looks really impressive to look at but I got tired of wires hanging out everywhere on all my scopes so I did you know uh management cable management whatever you call it I put a video out a long time ago on it and a lot of people now, Blake has the, 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 the little computer on top. I'm going to try that eventually. I'm going to get to it. But everything works so easy. And like you said, it takes me 15 minutes to get going. So unless something breaks, I'm just going to keep the laptop going. <laughs> okay. But on the left side, I have a rig runner power supply and then the control for my moonlight focusing. So all of these have, have uh, fuses in it, and they control different things on my on my rig so i don't have a whole lot of them i'm just the camera uh focuser and i forget what the other one is but then on the other side i have my hub which is for data so basically when i put this on top of my this manly mount the only two wires i've got coming off of my scope are the data wire and the power wire so i run the power <laughs> to the power supply i run the data to a usb port on my laptop and i'm up and running that's an intensely well-built and well-configured wire management and handling of all the things that you plug into it. So now you've set it up where it's kind of self-containing. You plug in that one wire and the other wire you mentioned, and now you have control over the camera 
and sending the signal to, uh, let's see, the two things that you were taking the power was power to it and then just communicating with the what? Communicating yes. with. So I've got camera power. I've got the power to the uh, camera on the uh, off-axis guider, and I've got the moonlight focuser powered on this one. My, my hub is up top. And I only have a couple of things. I used to have a whole bunch of stuff hooked up, but now it's gotten so much better. The way, especially with these Seymour sensors, uh, I can't really put, I'm sure Blake can see it on the back of his, but you know, I just can't put it up. If you look on the back, it's got connections for your guide scope, your power, oh, okay. everything on the back of the camera. So all of those connections, I don't have to run anywhere but from, from the device right to the back of the camera. So that simplifies so much. And, uh, and when you go outside and not have all these cables, because cables will get caught, and then you'll end up, you know, where they're dragging, and you end up in a 20-minute image. It's hard to lose a 20-minute image. So <laughs> Yeah, uh, for sure. Right. So, um, other so, than that, mine pretty much the same setup as this William Optics uh, setup. Now, your mount, um, if I tell anybody anything, well, my dog's walking in front of my tripod. Is Duke door. in there? Hey, Duke. Yeah. He just <laughs> cruised in front of my tripod. I put the camera on it. Um, <laughs> one quick thing, and I'll, I'll shut up. The... Uh, this what we're doing here what blake and i are doing here yeah this is a big step up and and when i got into this i want i saw people shooting these kinds of pictures and i said i'm going to learn to do that and i was motivated to learn it and spend the money but you don't have to go this far down the road to pull out images like i'm shooting and like blake shooting so maybe on another video one day we can talk about cheaper ways to do this. DSLR is still a great way. Um, it still produces nice images. It's a little harder and you don't have the cooling. You can make cooling for it. But, you know, like the uh, Skyguider Pro from uh, IOPS, not IOPS, is it IOPS? William Optics? The, wait, well, Skyguider Pro. I don't... Skyguider Pro, that's IOPS. Yeah. And Skywatcher yeah. makes one. Uh, uh, Explore Scientific makes one. Everybody's got them now. And then on the back of the Sky Guider Pro, they actually have a guide port on it. So now you can take that little mini guide scope that Blake has on this, on his, uh, lens, uh, yeah, the... 71 and you can put that on a bracket on your Sky Guider Pro and plug it in, and you can shoot 10, 15 minute images on a Sky Guider Pro now, and uh, they are beautiful. I mean, if you so get you're a suggest decent polar alignment, you can, you can get some great images. So let me uh, bring in Blake's scene just as much. I'm going to right click is not. Okay, remove spotlight up here. Okay, cool. Now we're going to show all. Let me show the gallery again. All right, cool. So now I got Blake just as big. So you're suggesting that this little scope right here, the gui the guiding scope, you attach it to a tracker like the iOptron or maybe even the Skywatch Star Adventurer, and with its guidance to keep the polar alignment or alignment of whatever star you're pointing at, you could get up to 10, 15 minute of a capture without trailing? Yeah, because I was shooting with my Sky Guider Pro, I was shooting five minutes without guiding. Mm -hmm. And uh, but that was just getting a really good uh, polar alignment where I used my pole master, which is on this scope up there, uh, to get a good polar alignment. But once I put a guide scope on it, plugged it into the thing, yeah, man, I was getting ten minute images out of that. Okay, and, cool. And sharp as a tack, stars around. <laughs> now here's the thing, everybody. I am not a gear guy. I'm never going to memorize any of these numbers or any of this information because flat out I don't care. I just can't be bothered to learn everything about gear. I just like to know how to use the gear I have. And so I get this this segment out of the way so everyone has that information who was curious. I didn't see any more questions pop through, so we're not going to talk about it unless you bring it up. If you have a question, let me know. Because now let's do some quick hit. Just practical questions that I will kind of direct to both of you, Blake and Sean, to see, okay, how would we tackle this scenario jumping into this skill set? So while I do that, I'm just going to open up a few of the images that I said to Blake that I had, and it took me forever to find, because Blake, for some reason, I put in a folder marked March 2nd. 
why it came out <laughs> last week and I marked it for March second, but here they are. So you I'm just can gonna... also you can also go to my website while you're there too. And I am happily yeah, going to. So okay. first Blake, I don't know if you can actually see let's see, let me go ahead and go to the Zoom call and share my screen so you guys can see what I am sharing. So I'm gonna share the window that shows Blake's image. So Blake, this image right here what area of the sky is this and which camera did you use the one that you showed us did you use that to capture this yes yeah i did um what is this i believe that's the eagle nebula Sean, yeah that, that's the eagle nebula yeah no. thank you <laughs> i want to make sure um that shot with the mono camera beautiful it's got about oh let's go back it's got about what five or six hours of collection time when, when you start shooting deep sky objects you can't shoot them in 30 seconds, you have to spend hours. Um, and then you stack all the images and, and process them. So I see. Yeah, maybe. So then when you go to this next image, oh, not me, that's me and Mike, uh, me <laughs> and Steve and Kirk. So I'm going this direction. This next image, what is this area? That's Lagoon Nebula and the Triffid Nebula. So in our Lagoon Milky Way left. shots, um, let me do a real quick pull up of a Milky Way shot from Aaron King. Oh, I know. I say this is quick, but it's not actually quick. It's in the Southern Milky Way, just so you want to find it. Oh, the Lagoon Nebula, though? I thought the yeah, Lagoon, Lagoon Nebula is near the core. Have we been always – I'm thinking of the Lagoon something else? No, Lagoon, Triffid, and Eagle are all in the southern sky up, up high. So right here, Sean, near the core in the northern hemisphere, I've been told and been kind of yeah, living that, that like that's it. the Lagoon. Is that the yeah. Lagoon? Looks like it. It's pretty bright. No. Okay, so this section of our Milky Way. So you're thinking about your Milky Way, everybody, and you're looking at your panorama that you're going to capture this month, and you're looking towards the core. You start to see a bright spot towards that middle part. Uh, let me try a different one that maybe doesn't have it so pulled out. Here's that bright spot right there, and it shows up a lot better in this image of all of them because it's nice and isolated. There's this section of the core. So this highlighted is the section of the sky that you captured here, but up close. Yes. Oh, yes. that's so cool looking. Now with the coloring, uh, and actually, no, we're going to come back to coloring. No one okay. to get the coloring. Cause <laughs> that's, that's kind of interesting, actually. That's a whole yeah. different discussion. But I'm going through these pictures, and Steve did ask me, what exposure times are you getting, Blake, with your setup? Um, right now I'm sticking with about five minutes. Um, I can consistently do that and not – waste hardly any frames. Um, I'd like to extend that some, but for right now with the guiding I've got and everything I've got, five minutes is a good place to start. Okay. That's beautiful. Five minutes and you capture one for each of your color wheel filters, three different well, filters. I capture, like like I said, I'll do an hour or two hours for each filter. Oh, I see. Five minute exposure. So as many images in yeah. an hour as you get and yeah. stack them. And then do that for multiple nights and then stack it all together. Okay, so what's this area? Elef that's the Elephant Trunk Nebula. Elephant Trunk Nebula. Okay, right on. This one? Heart Nebula. Heart Nebula. That's so crazy cool. That's with a one-shot color camera. One-shot color camera. So it's a yeah. different camera than this one. Yes. Okay, and this last one? Uh, oh. That is the Seagull. I just love the just insane like sh Warshak test that's happening here where we all see it. <laughs> we all can see that shape of the bird. Yeah, you know, I always wanted to know when they name these things because it seems kind of <laughs> modern on a lot of them. It's like nobody from years ago came up with Pac-Man Nebula. You wouldn't know what Pac-Man no, was. Yeah, that would be new. <laughs> yeah, how did you come up with Pac-Man? That had to yeah. be recent. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> so then now that I've shown a few of these images, you can see pinks and orange and red and just kind of a muted brown with the cobalt sulfur. blue sulfur sulfur is a good word for that then this one high intense blues and then looking at the Aquaman. green that's in here and then if i were to go back to this screen that would show i want to show everybody but also you won't hear you won't hear sean and you won't hear blake so i'll jump back to them soon the color choices that are made in this image yeah, it's just so fantastic. I'm going to pull up Sean's images now, and we're going to go back to talking about specifically images. But while I'm pulling up Sean's images, let me go ahead and, oh, geez, my neighbors are breaking things down there. 
Fantastic. Okay, stop sharing. I can see you too. So while I go and pull up Sean's stuff, I'm going to let Sean tackle this one. Color choice. Blake had several different colors there. What's happening and what happens with your kind of narrow band photography that we maybe haven't considered coming from the visible spectrum? Well, that's a good question and kind of to one's each choice. It's, it's narrow band has been a long time called false color. Um, typically you're trying to pull out the oxygen blue, the hydrogen reds, and the sulfur yellows and, and those, those areas. I don't use Photoshop at all for processing my images. I use a, a software called PixInsight, which is a software that was developed solely for astrophotography. Um, it's very robust, very, it, it, it's got a pretty steep learning curve, but it's, it's actually a wonderful software. Um, so, uh, a lot of my images tend to lean into the same color range. Um, a lot of your images are going to come up green when you first pull them up. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of green that comes out, and there's a way you can pull some of that green out of there ahead of time and fix in sight and then go back and, and, and process them. But, you know, some people like the green. Some people like the reds, purples, whatever. It just depends on what you like. Um, I don't think there is a set way. The only real, I think the only real way to see what they truly look like is to go through a one shot color and, and see what they really look like rather than uh, trying to use the back filter. So let's do a comparison side by side, not for whose is better, one's wrong, one's right. <laughs> I just want to look at this because I see that we both have an elephant trunk here. So here's Blake's, and then here is Sean's. So Blake's and Sean's. Blake's has some vignetting, interesting clouding dynamic with the stars showing up there. And Sean's is tight, just showing. Now this vignetting is just the nebula out there. Is that what I'm not knowing? Is that this nebula has this kind of almost 1970s music video look to it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's probably my processing. I'm still learning. <laughs> oh, you really think you processed out some of the cloudy detail of uh, the probably, nebulas in the yeah. corners? Because no, I'm trying to, trying to get the contrast. Nebula. Me? Say that again. It's a giant, giant nebula. Yeah. Okay. Because as I look at the details in Sean's, I can see right here, there's a little bit of an edge that kind of matches with the edging here. So I thought maybe mm -hmm. it was that case, almost like it was a, a wormhole into another area mm -hmm. that just kind of opened up right here. We had to look into a telescope almost at it. But looking at the coloring, the handling of the detail here, Everyone has questions about the post-processing and the elements of it. And one of our viewers already has a head start on the answer, talking about some of the ways that you can handle it. And it says that it looks like the Hubble palette. Um, Blake, it is. coming yeah. from your perspective, just barely getting into it, I know Sean and I have talked about the Hubble palette. Give us your explanation of using the Hubble palette, or have you even considered the Hubble palette? I, I use it quite a bit now. Um, it's, I wish there was an easy answer on how to do it. Um, Sean says he uses PixInsight exclusively. I'm learning PixInsight. I use PixInsight for all the initial um, stuff on the on the image until I make it a color image and then I move it into Photoshop and work on it there because I'm more familiar with Photoshop. Yeah, okay. I just don't know it. Yeah. But, but, but well, Say that again, Sean, you just don't what? I, I just don't know uh, Photoshop very well for uh, Astro, so I just learned PixInsight. Okay, cool. Go ahead, Blake. PixInsight, it, there is a steep learning curve, but it's not insurmountable. There's a lot of good YouTube videos. Um, I learn a little bit all the time on how to, how to use it more. Um, but the color choices, it, it is funny because everybody argues about the color of the Milky Way. Um, you know, won't have a blue Milky Way and all that. And mm -hmm, movie right. The deep sky stuff, I was surprised <laughs> that there are many interpretations on the colors um, of these nebula. Um, like you said, if you take it with a one shot color, most of these would be very red. Yeah. The hydrogen alpha is usually the dominant um, color in each image. The Hubble palette requires quite a bit of manipulation um, to make it look good. Does that make, is that a good way to put that, Sean? Yeah, Aaron, are you familiar with how we do the Hubble palette? Uh, not entirely. So go ahead and so, give us that explanation since it'll benefit yeah. everybody. Th like this image 
is well, what happened? That was me. Okay. I covered okay. it up with another window. Sorry. This is almost a five year image for me. Uh, I think I shot this like five years ago. But what we do is we take an RGB color palette. And the, the Hubble palette comes in several different ways. SHO, the show palette, is the one a lot of people like to use. Uh, you can use the WHO palette, HUHU. We use those on Planetary Netherlands a lot of times. But basically what we do is we pull up an RGB image and in the red, we would input the, the S, which is the S2 and, and G would get the uh, hydrogen alpha and the RGBB would get the, uh, the oxygen. So that's our three filters, hydrogen alpha, oxygen, S2. That's your three narrow band filters. So all we're doing is plugging in those filters into an RGB palette and then kicking them out and processing them after that. So then you're tackling it based on the elements that are inside that nebula or are found more profoundly in the nebula or is helium and oxygen and um, sulfur names that are terms but not necessarily defining the No, no, elements. hydrogen alpha most just like your color your images you find a lot of red that's hydrogen alpha there's a you know the, the things out there in space are made up of a lot of hydrogen alpha oh absolutely. sulfur two and oxygen okay oxygen so tends to it. fall in the blue scales sulfur two tends to fall in your yellows and in those that palette and then hydrogen alpha is going to give you your reds and, and those those palettes so all we're doing for, for if we want to do the show palette, which is the, the big one everyone uses, which is what I typically use most of the time, then I just go SHO into RGB. So it's sulfur, hydrogen, oxygen into those channels. So one of the ways that we can kind of really show that off is something that Clarence hooked me up with that he was going to talk about. And I'll just show it before he gets here so that you guys can see it. But this is an example of an H-alpha only filter. There you go. how crazy red it is and then if you were to have a little bit lp enhanced filter i don't know what the lp stands for without light uh, pollution light pollution enhanced filter thank you good guess or good knowledge um then the light po light pollution extreme filter added in there a four astro filter stack and then here's the final oh actually this was a visible plus H alpha filter, and then the oh, final yeah. stack. So I put them in the wrong order in my folder, but this was kind of the fourth thing added to it where I added some visible and then added in that H alpha. That and alpha H alpha brought it out. Yeah. Brought out the reds, brought out all the intensities of the colors that you can have there, especially in the red. Now so, you see the lagoon, that does, clearly. <laughs> yeah, really popping right here, isn't it? Yeah. So then when you're thinking about as a brand new photographer to this and you're getting into editing, you're saying, Blake, that you do yours in Photoshop or in PixInsight. I didn't follow yet. I do the, the all the the initial stuff in PixInsight. Um, I combine, I, my process is I make them starless. I combine them. I do some noise reduction. Um, so I have a color image. And then I move that color image into um, Photoshop and work on the color and the contrast and trying to make it what I like, um, put the stars back in, um, and then come up with a final image. That's kind of where I'm at right now with my, my workflow. So the workflow includes a section, a moment where your stars are not the visible element on the screen and you're really bringing out the cloudy element of the nebula. And then right. you have the star layer that you kind of bring back in. Correct. Interesting. Yeah. Um, just yeah. one of the comments that Steve Sagnotti just said is absolutely a true statement. And unfortunately, I'm going to be out of town for six straight weeks where I can't be here. But he says this needs to be the same subject over multiple nights. You know, like how to register a camera, how to do composition, everything. Like uh, he would it's just a love... lot to talk about. <laughs> it is, I, it I, is. Can, I can do a simple answer for a beginner. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good Aaron, thing. If you don't mind, go pull that heart nebula of mine. Look at the center of his heart nebula. Yeah, and then there, there's a center image of the heart. Hang on, I'll help you with it. There yeah. it is. Uh, right. No, nope. nope. Rosette tadpole. Going. That's the jellyfish. Scroll down. Oh, keep going down. Oh, this oh, jellyfish fine. crescent it's, nebula. Keep going. Keep going. Right there, heart nebula. Right there. 
Uh, I, I keep pointing at it, but you can't see my finger. Right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sadly. That, that's in the center of that heart nebula, and I have another one. It's called Merlot 15, but I have another one where I shot a mosaic of it and went all the way across the entire seat of it, if you want to look at it. But I want, you can see the difference with the blues and the, from the one-shot color, um, how it, it's different when you use that show palette. That's yeah, mine is a one-shot color. Yeah. So they're different orientations, but you yeah. can see the like kind of the wrinkle right here in yeah. Blake's that is I think this. If you defined. go to the mosaic, you'll you'll find a better you'll see better. Um, how do I get to your mosaic? Go back to the main screen where all the pictures are. Yeah. And you, and you move, scroll down. Scrolling down. Go up. I don't know. I've been so long. Um, it doesn't feel like it's showing me all your images, and I click on the gallery. Uh, um, I'm only seeing s some of them because I know I've seen yeah. that these, this list goes on quite a bit longer than this. Now I tell you what, stop a second and click on the one above that old elephant. Don't click on that elephant. This one right here. That one right there. That's it. I want to show that that one too. That is a four panel, and I use a guide scope on this one. Um, that's a four panel. That's big bright star is Seder. That's in the middle of the Northern Cross, which is up right now at night around 11, 30, 12 o'clock. It comes up. But that's a portion of the Butterfly Nebula. But that's actually four panels where I had to shoot all three filters. So divide that image in four. And each fourth had to be shot for 27 hours. Oh. All three. So I shot 21 images of each filter for each of the four panels. So it's three times 24 for each of the panels. But that's a gorgeous part of the sky. And, it, and if you could see further south, you would see where the elephant is and where all that. That's that's right now what's up in the in the northern part of the uh, Milky Way. And it's my favorite place to shoot in. So. so that really brings into a topic that is on the mind of Steve Sagnati. He's reminding us, and I did want to get into it, is the whole element of taking these kind of pictures over multiple nights. Because you just said 24 or 27 hours. Obviously, there's a daytime period in there. So, it, Sean, take us through some of the reality of doing a mosaic like this over multiple nights. Well, two, two things. Um, if I – let me back up. I'm sure. If I have a clear week, I can – let's just take one image, one-fourth of it. If I have a clear week, I can shoot each night – especially during the winter time when you have more light, I can usually get 18 images. So I get 18 of my 24 images. Um, so did you say 44 or 24? 24. Okay. 18 of your 24 so images. I shoot okay. 24 hydrogen alpha, 24 oxygen, 24 sulfur. Um, but here's something you, that I learned a hard lesson on is when you want to do a mosaic, you don't want to shoot, Say you're gonna do like this one, which is a four panel mosaic. You don't wanna shoot all the data for that first panel and then go shoot all the data for the second panel and then the third panel, the fourth panel, because you're gonna have a density issue. What you wanna do is shoot a few of the hydrogen on the first panel and, get, and then go to the second panel, track over to that, shoot that, and, and, and move it around till you get all your images so that you get a, a uh, exposure that's a lot they're all in line with each other because you'll end up with one that's darker than the other because the you know the moon might have been out or the skies uh, are bad okay. you know and, and so you're not getting the same exposure on on the sensor that you were getting for the first time around and now you got to go into post processing and try to process all that and balance all that stuff so you know, but basically you just you shoot all your images for your filters and then you go into well, I go to Pixon site and there's a process that you go in to register it all and, and join them all together. I do what I do is I shoot a 50 to 20 percent overlap on everything. And I'm using uh, SG Pro, no, 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 sorry, Sequence Generator Pro for my capturing software. And it has, it, uh, it's built into the software to create mosaics. And you can tell it, I want to overlap all my images by 15 percent or however much you want to do it. So when you do go to put all those images together, you give yourself some play, and uh, you know you got some wiggle room in there in case you got a, a you know a side of an image that's just not that perfect. But 
basically you just go into the software and hook them all together and then you know create that one image and then once you get all four together and create the one image you push all the others aside and that's your that's your beginning and then you process that that's really good tip that I hope everyone caught. When you think about how to handle doing multiple nights, a tip from Sean is to make sure then you go out that first night, capture something from each area. And you mentioned specifically hydrogen alpha. So for instance, you might do all your hydrogen alpha shots of that area. And then the next night do another filter of all those shots, a different area. Am I understanding it correctly? Or would you do hydrogen? Yeah, I, use, I, I shoot like uh, now what I do is if, I, I, I four panel mosaics are kind of a pain. They take a while, so I've kind of dropped down to two panels. <laughs> okay. But what I'll what I'll do is I'll shoot say five or six images of hydrogen on the first target, and then I'll shift over to the other one and shoot six of those, and then shift back and shoot until I finish up the hydrogen. Then I switch over to the oxygen and do the same thing. Just switch back and forth so that I'm not completing all those all that data for one image. And then going to the next one because I have a, I have two images right now the California Nebula and the Elephant Nebula that right now I didn't do that and I am struggling to merge those to go together because you can clearly see that the data is different from one another because I shot them all at once. Oh, okay. Don't make that mistake. <laughs> so now you're getting kind of in your head, everybody. The real reality of not only a challenge, but one of the great benefits of doing this method is that unlike your Milky Way shots where you're trying to get all the conditions to work well for you, and that night, you don't just come back and take a bunch of shots the next night and the next night or wait until the next cloudless night and then capture and finish your image. Not typically. I don't know anyone who has done that at all. But typically in this kind of photography, out of your backyard with narrow band because the light pollution won't be a factor. You still wait for a cloudless night, but you don't have to wait for a moonless night. And then you just use your clear sky as you've got. When you're sitting there at home, Sean, or even Blake, actually I'll have both of you answer this. When you're thinking about capturing a scene, and you're working out in your head, I want to capture that tonight. I'm going to put my camera up in here, here tomorrow and put my camera outside and set it up. What are you looking for? Do you do you plan and align even during the daytime where you're going to be pointing your telescope? Sean's already I, shaving, shaking his head yes, uh, nodding your head yes. Um, I I uh, I use like I said, Sequence Generator Pro, and it has a thing called framing and mosaic built in the software. So say I want to go shoot a target, um, the Lagoon Nebula. Um, I'll go in there, type in Lagoon, and it'll pull it up, and then it, it's got all the information about what camera I'm using, what scope I'm using, so it knows the dimensions of everything in it, and it, then I can just go draw. If I draw a big box, it'll, or, you know, it'll, it'll make a mosaic. If I draw two boxes, make the same one, shoot one image of it, then I can make that one box and then grab my cursor, and I can comp you know, compositionally move it around how I want it, and how I want it set up and, and twist it, turn it, however I want to do. Then when I go out to sh save all that, and then when I go to shoot that night, I use what's called plate solver, and it's built in as well. So when I set up and everything's ready to go, I just say plate solve to that, to that target that I've set up, and the, the telescope's going to swirl over to the target. It's going to shoot a picture of it. It's going to calculate, because I have 50 pixels, it's got to be with it. It's going to calculate whether oh. it's there or not. And then it's going to make a correction, and it's going to slow a little bit, recalculate, slow a little bit, until it gets it within 50 pixels, and then I'm there. Start guiding and start shooting. So when it's doing that automatically for you, is it also hitting the exposure for you automatically? Well, it will. Once once it plate solves, it'll begin the exposure. There's another box you go and say, oh, look, I want 24 images of that hydrogen alpha. I want 20 minutes on each shot, and I need 24 of them. Start process, and then it'll just go. So like Blake was saying, it takes 15 minutes. Once I get it set up before dark, I pull a line, and then I've already got my target built. So I just say center on target, and it goes, plate solves it, 
and then begins the imaging process. And then, like I said, I walk away. I can just go make dinner and look at it on the computer from inside or go play with another camera and do something different. <laughs> That's what you started saying, Blake, in the beginning, how you said you'll have your telescope set up while you're also doing your Star Tracker shot over there with another tripod. Tell us a little bit more about your process. Really, I mean, I my goal is to have a complicated process like that. I'm not there yet, obviously. With uh, an actual schedule guider pro, is that what he said? Well, well he could do it with the yeah. mommy's got, yeah. Oh, but okay. For simplicity's sake, for me, um, the ASI Air, you can take an image you took last week that's stored in the ASI Air, tap it, say go to, and it'll go to that, say those same coordinates, and it'll play itself. And it, so if you're shooting, the, not a mosaic, but if you're shooting the same image over and over, um, you can get them lined up enough to add that data to their, your previous images. Um, it makes it pretty easy to do that. Um, the only thing is if you've changed anything in your setup, but that's another problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so for me, that's how I make sure that I, the question was, how do you make sure each night matches? For me, that's how I do it. Um, the, the other thing is there's also a planning mode in ASI Air where you can schedule it to do various things. I've done it at home where I've just set it to run and gone to bed and, nice. and you have your pictures. Um, doesn't always work perfectly, but I've had pretty good luck with it. <laughs> For me shooting from home, one of the hardest things is obstacles. What yeah. obstacles? I live in Oceanside. I've got trees. I've got street lights. I've got mm. uh, everywhere. Power lines. I have to choose my my subject to be clear of all those things. So there's some some thought you have to put into it prior to shooting. Which is kind of nice that your subject typically is like Lagoon Nebula. You're not trying to capture that whole Milky Way core. You're trying to yeah. capture that little dot inside the yeah. Milky Way core. So if there's a power line here and a power line there, and your dots yeah. on the inside. It still works, right? Yeah. Yeah. Correct. Um, I, you know, I have a couple of street lights that are just in the worst place they could ever be. Narrow band, as long as you're not pointed really close to the street light, it still works because that light isn't in the same, uh, bandwidth that you're shooting. Oh, really? But when it gets to the street light, then everything blows out. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Point a laser at the uh, street lights and you'll shut them off. Do you really turn off some of your street lights like that? I don't have them anymore where I live, but uh, yeah, in my old house, I would shoot a laser at the little sensor. Would, you know. You're like, it's daytime, it's daytime, turn off. A laser at the sensor. I hadn't thought that. I like that. It idea. works. It works. So, <laughs> Blake, when you're tracking with your typical five minutes and going for an hour, you're not having that much change in the sky. So the objects that are in your way, they can creep in, but you're not moving too much no, in an no. hour. Yeah. But then and there are I, there are gaps in my in my sky that I can do that. Okay. And yeah. Sean, you've sent me pictures from your home. You're like, that tree I wish it would have been knocked down by the storm. If that hurricane would have knocked down that tree, I would have gotten X. What was it that you were wishing you had more of a view of? Well, I have yeah, I lost a huge pecan tree, which was a blessing because now I get my <laughs> targets much earlier from Hurricane <laughs> Ida. But it missed the other ones that were in the further background. And so right now Cygnus is coming up over that tree at around 11.30 now. Three weeks ago, it's coming up at 1.30. So I give it another week or two. It's going to be coming up around 9.30. And there was a time where I would go out at 2, 3 in the morning and set up and shoot, but those times are gone. So <laughs> uh, I'll start at 9, no problem, but I'm not going out there at 12 o'clock. So right now, I'm waiting for Cygnus to get up over the top of that tree. And uh, once it does, I've got all night to shoot. So. Okay. Um, <clears throat> looks like Clarence is probably not going to be able to make it back to the family emergency before we close out and get into some Q&A. So before I get everyone ready for their Q&A questions, I'm going to ask Blake a question first. But Sean, think about your answer to this. It's going to be a what would you explain to a newbie to this that they like, okay, I am Sean and I've done this for two and a half, three years. I know you've done it for much more than that. But imagine that you're two years into it. What did you know then that you wish you knew? New at the very beginning so give us your best two years into this you're going to learn this advice that you're going to hook us up with and blake okay. you just transitioned you're six months into this what can you tell us that 
is what we need to key on as learn this, understand this, or this is different than the Milky Way? Is there anything that stands out in any of those areas? Except that it's going to be much more difficult. <laughs> it difficult in what way? In planning, in equipment, in processing. It's not, I wouldn't call it hard. It's just a lot of information to gather. Um, there are great YouTube videos. I mean, there, there are great places to learn it. Um, but just, you're going to have some really bad images at first. And just accept that. You're not going to, you're not going to get a great image initially. You didn't with Milky Way either. Um, and have patience with it. Um, I mean, you saw my images, they not, may not be perfect, but I mean, I'm pretty happy with that at six months. Oh, I am. I think they're awesome. Yeah. And, uh, I'd like to keep working on that and improve and someday have telescopes and images like Sean. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Blake, before I leave your question from me, when you think about your processing of these images, do you think you have elements to learn or is things just change because of experience? I'm trying to figure out when I'm thinking about working with some of my photos, I think, okay, I have this skill set in Photoshop. I need to gain this skill set, skill set here, gain this skill set there. When you're thinking of working in PixInsight, is there something that you know you're not good at yet that you're trying to get to? Is there something that we can't understand oh, what that would be? There are so many processes in PixInsight. Yeah. I don't have any idea what a lot of them do. Huh, uh, okay. A lot, there are a lot that could probably solve some of the problems I have, but I haven't gotten there yet. Um, and there's about 10 different ways to skin a cat. Yeah. Um, for me, Photoshop is a little more straightforward because I've been using it for a long time. So once I get to the part where it's just about color and contrast, I have a tendency to switch over to Photoshop because I'm familiar. When, uh, yeah. when you take time on these images that I've been sharing, like the really green one, the blue Lagoon Nebula, the, the kind of nice, soft, almost sepia-toned look of elephant trunk, the red rosette, all the processing on each of these images very similar amount of time or did some of them take an extra amount of time and what is the length of time it takes for you to post process that, uh, very difficult to answer that question because oh, yeah it, yeah it could be depending on if you like the results you're getting i mean i've processed some in an hour okay worked on off and on for days um it's very difficult to give you a, a time period but i can say that about milky way also yeah, uh, I get what you're saying. My Milky Way editing is, is quick right now, unless I don't like my result, and then I have to move it. <laughs> awesome, perfect. Okay, so Sean, did I give you enough time to think about what that mm -hmm. piece of advice would be? All right, hit it. I think for the most part would be to, to A, keep it simple. Um, don't spend a ton of money uh, right off the bat because you're inevitably going to buy gear. People are going to tell you things, and you're going to buy gear that you may not need. Know what you're buying first um, and try to find people. There are people out there that will help you. Uh, I would help you. Um, other people out there will help you. They helped me when I didn't know anything. So uh, try to get it. You don't have to have all of this to go and create images that get you super excited. Hmm. So you can, you can start off small. And, and, and get just as excited as I did when I was starting off. And then you can work your way up. So um, that would be the main thing, because if you try to go to this before you really know what you're doing, you're gonna end up spending money you don't need, and then you're gonna be on places selling gear, buying gear like I did, and, and I, I, I don't wish that on anybody. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so when you think about Milky Way photography, I would tell people to make sure they get the core looking good, and then you know grow into stacking, tracking, Milky Way panoramas, dual exposure, foreground, focus on the foreground even. When you think about an entry level <laughs> image of the deep sky, what targets come to mind, Sean? Uh, well, everybody loves Orion, but Orion's actually a tough image to process. The actual the Orion course, Nebula? Yeah, the core is so blown out that you almost have to shoot, well, you do have to shoot really two different images of two different exposures or exposure lengths and then bind them together so that you don't lose the stars in the core. But um, the, the uh, Lagoon Nebula is a great, it's a bright nebula. You can shoot that. The, uh, the North American Nebula has a lot of bright, uh, uh, nebulas in it that you can shoot rather easily. 
Um, and when I started, everybody told me, don't get into pics and sight. That's for professionals. That's for people who know what they're doing. And, and I said, well, if they can do it, I can do it. <laughs> and, so, and so I said, why would I buy Photoshop when I know I'm going to pics and sight, spend two years learning Photoshop, and then have to repeat it to learn pics and sight? So I just bought pics and sight. And, and I, uh, I started there. And their processes, you can pull them out of the program and stack them up on the right side of the screen in order that you like to use them. And when I first started, I had like five or six things that I would do. And like, like I said, there's a bunch of them that I still don't know how to use. But now, my whole board's filled with things that I use to process my images because I've learned how to use the processes. And like I said earlier, there's a lot of great YouTube videos that are way more than there were when I started this. Um, but uh, Warren Keller, who, who started Pix Insight, has a uh, website called IP for AP. It's uh, India Papa 4, the number 4, Alpha Papa. So IP for AP. Um, you can go onto that site and join that site, and there's a whole bunch of free uh Tests or programs in there, you know, they'll teach you how to use all those processes. There's a ton of them. You probably get about 150 of them for free. Before you, and then it's only like five dollars a month if you want to stay with it and get all the other processes. So um, check that out if you want to learn about fixing site. And and there's a lot of free YouTube sites. There's a lot of people I can name off that are doing some great work that I've learned a ton from. So. Oh, okay, awesome. Now, with this being that Clarence couldn't join us tonight and that we couldn't possibly cover even a tenth of what we could about this topic, that we're going to be doing this again throughout the year. Um, I know that Blake and Sean, you're both eager to come back. I'm sure Clarence will be as well. So we can understand that in the future, everybody, we'll have more coming. And I want you to think, Blake and Sean, and help me think, okay, if I was a brand new person, I wish I had this information. And I want to try and create a PDF document with you that I can share with everybody the next time we come on here and basically teach the PDF document, explain it, and let them have it with them so that everyone has a little bit of a hand-holding guide on whatever you two might think would be important. So just kind of help think about that. And also to foreshadow to everyone watching that uh, we will be coming back with more. I have a question for everybody that's gonna come here in a minute, but first think about what you would like to ask these two before we end the show tonight. So get some Q&A going in your head and hit me up with an all caps question in the chat so that I know it's there. And I'm gonna get it started here with Blake. Blake, um, I, I mean, I'm really already asking I questions. Step away just one second. Yeah, you bet, I'm gonna feature Blake. All right, so Blake, oh. <laughs> this is all you now, man. This no. Is... <laughs> okay, what were the common mistakes you made in the beginning? Um, hmm. good question. <laughs> mistakes? Um, what are those? Yeah, no, I made lots of mistakes. <laughs> um, and I know it's kind of the opposite of what a lot of people say. Yeah, don't spend a ton of money on on gear, but get decent gear um you'll be happier with your images and more encouraged to go further um like i said what i have isn't i mean we added it up it's the price of a camera which isn't crazy um you can do it a little bit cheaper than i've done it but it really to me i fought with the, my DS, dslr um just wasn't getting what i wanted uh, okay. I got way more excited once I started getting what I wanted. <laughs> yeah. Is there something that we should know as we think about, because I'm not going to have a CCD, that little red cylinder on the back of my telescope. Yeah. I have a Red Cat 51. In fact, Bill Vincent even mentioned, he says, Aaron, do this. He goes, buy the Skywatcher track or the Skywatcher Star Adventure, get a William Optics Red Cat 51, use your Canon camera with a cheap adapter and tripod and later get a guider. And so you think about doing right, that with so all visible light. What are you... What did you miss when you used only your visible camera, your DSLR, that you were happy to get rid of with your part CCD? Of Let me, and I want to specify part of the reason I feel that way. Yeah. Is shooting from here. Okay. Uh, this is in addition to my Milky Way stuff mostly. Um, it's on nights when I can't do Milky Way, um, and there's a ton of light pollution here. 
and it's really difficult to shoot with that much light pollution with a DSLR. DSLR. Um, that guided my guided my choices to the mono camera and all that because of where I'm shooting. Um, if you have if you are in an area with less light pollution, then you might get much better results than I did out of your DSLR. Probably I see. in Utah, where That's I want to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, move here. And so it's kind of been a I can't do Milky Way, so I'll do deep sky. So narrow band and dealing with out any of the light pollution worries is why this works out so well. You yeah, because recently... I, I can do it from home. In addition to my, in addition to my Milky Way, um, I'm not have to leave my wife and everything to go do this. I can do it. I can do it from here. Honestly, you're right. Cause I love the idea mm-hmm. of decorating my walls with really neat deep sky like intimate shots and a very showing, similar idea <laughs> yeah okay and like people come in like what is that where who I'm like i captured that myself yeah it's kind of like capturing the picture that everyone else has but it's just that's mine that's my edit of it that's my color preference of it that is the trunk of the elephant you know i mean this is really <laughs> cool to show off that kind of stuff well when I'm thinking about, it's not behind me anymore. My my my, my tripod is good for my Skywatch Star Adventure, but not necessarily anything heavier. And so I think about the recent comment you made, Blake, that you switched up mounts recently. What did you have before, and what is the name of the mount again? That's that giant robot arm behind you. I just had the Skywatcher Star Adventurer before. So uh, you mount was just the actual white Skywatch Star Adventurer, yeah, not the yeah. tripod. We're not talking that. We're not talking legs. We're yeah. just talking the mount that's motorized. Okay. Yeah, what I started with. Yeah. Um, the this is Orion Sirius, which is not a high end mount. Um, it was all that was in stock anywhere when I tried to get a mount in December. Um, and it comes with tripod, the tripod with it. So it's all one piece or one one price. Uh, and like I said, it, it's not the most sophisticated thing in the world, but for what I'm doing, which is relatively wide angle, um, it tracks fine. Everything works out well. I've been very happy with it. Awesome. So then, Sean, your gigantic pillar that could probably hold 700 of me. I mean, what is that telescope mound right there? That, that is, legs and everything. That's an American-made from California, Lost Mandy G11. Lost um, Mandy G11? Yeah, Lost Man is a company in California. They're really known for their movie equipment that they make, their lighting oh. booms and all that kind of stuff. Wow, that they come but it is it is a uh, I couldn't afford the Mach one, which I really wanted. Um, but the Lost Man has proven to be a it's a great mount. And to go back to Blake, that serious mount, that was gonna be the mount I bought uh, when I first started. Oh um, yeah. So I, I couldn't afford it. And uh, <laughs> but I finally got what was called an EQ6 uh, from Skywatcher, which I picked up for about $1,100 on sale. And then I shot those for a long time, but then I finally moved up to this P11. And it's just been a spectacular amount, and the people at Los Mandy are great, and it can hold up to, you know, 89 pounds of the pressure of uh, weight on top of it. So I haven't, wow. you know, I'm not putting anything else on it. But something that I keep thinking to tell to say to y'all yeah. is everything starts with the foundation. And if you don't build your foundation on a solid platform, then you're already going to be in the weeds. So what I'm talking about is your mount. If you want to get into astrophotography and, and you wanna you wanna shoot like Blake's doing and I'm doing, and you don't want to use the Sky Guide Pro with a decent tripod and those things. You want to actually get into maybe a Williams Optic Scope or the the, the, the the cat that you've got, the red cat. I love mine. Um, and you want to go to a real mount? Get a good mount. Uh, it makes all the and there are some mounts out there that are not so good. So, but the EQ6 from Skywatcher has, has been a workhorse for years. And you can get them for about a thousand or eleven hundred dollars, and you can even get used ones. I typically don't buy used ones because I never know what other people grind them on. Um, but there's uh, there's a lot of them out there that you got to build on your platform. If your platform is not strong, then everything that's built on top of it is going to be out. Of, it's going to be out of sync. No. So you got a good strong mount that does its job. Now you're building on a healthy platform, and you can build up your system on top of it. Okay. Well, then 
How many hernias have you gotten trying to move that thing outside? Mine goes in five pieces. Oh, I take the mount okay. head off. So I, I, I drag the tripod out first. I bring the mount head out second. I bring the weight out and whatever else I can carry, put the weight on it. And then I bring out the telescope and put it on top. Oh, and man. then I set up the table and put all, then I connect all the cables and do all that set up the computer, the power. All that, all said and done, I, I timed myself one time trying to race myself. And I, I, <laughs> from start to finish, I did in 20 minutes. Oh, okay. Um, it's not so, that cumbersome. No, it, it, I, you know, I was moving pretty quick, but you know, 20, 25 minutes is easy enough to set. And once I got it set up, um, and then it's just pull a line, get on target, focus, make sure your guiding's good. And then once you start that thing and it's imaging, you can walk away. I have a laptop on the counter in my kitchen that I can bring in any other room, and I can I can just you know tie in the laptop out in the yard, and I can watch everything. It's going to control it all. Go to my bed, go to sleep, control it. Um, I really want to try the ASI Air. I, I've been slow to go that route, but I'm definitely going to go that route eventually um, oh and God. get away from the laptops. But uh, right now, that's what I've got. Chris Whiting says, do you need a government grant to get started? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, you could actually, for $450 to $80, you can buy a SkyGuider Pro. $150, bucks, you can get the guide scope. Um, then you can buy uh, the, the guide camera and stuff to put on it. Get yourself a decent tripod. And, uh, well, it comes with a tripod. Get you like a two inch tripod with it. So, all of that, under a thousand dollars, you can have all of that. And you can either A, put a DSLR if you got good skies, um, or put like what we do with the Red Cats or the William Optic Scopes on them. Um, they've made a lot of filters now that are out now that you can put on. That's what I'm getting ready to experiment with with my uh, E850. I want to play with it, I want to try it. They've got filters now that I can screw on that I can actually shoot nebulas and stuff. They're expensive, but I can actually shoot light polluted skies and, and, and pick mm. up um, and, and get good shots on one shot color. So Ooh, there's a whole test. set of filters out there nowadays that are out there for one shot color folks. And I want to test it out being in a Bortle 8 9 sky. I, if they had a Bortle 16, I'd be in it. I'm in it. <laughs> So. Hey, the question came up again about your telescopes. What can you say really clearly what the optical tube is, the telescope for both of those next to you? Yeah, this one's a Richie Crichton. Richard Richie, Crichton. Richie Crichton, I can never remember, but it's basically known as an RC. Okay. Um, a lot of people, oh, don't get an RC. That you gotta wait for that. You know, you don't know. It's very no, I don't pay attention to all those people. Go buy an RC. <laughs> um, usually they're they're perfect right out of the box mine was but this this is a light gallery it's got a secondary mirror in it it's a little bit different from a refractor this is a refractor it's an explore scientific 80 millimeter refractor and it's got just like blake it's got the filter wheel an asi 294 mono camera on the back of it and then i've got an off-axis guider on it and uh, a moonlight focuser which basically i control you know, focusing all of it hands free from inside. So uh, that's the way I like to roll is not have to go out at three o'clock in the morning and focus <laughs> the telescope. So. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Kirk was wondering what you do for dew filters. I'm in the desert. I hardly worry about dew gathering. Do you or Blake, either yeah, of you do right. anything for that? Here, you can see it just underneath. That's my, my dew controller. Oh. And then there's one on here somewhere. On this side where, that we're looking at, there's a control with four knobs. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. That's the dew controller. And then I've got straps right here for dew. That's so intense. I don't put anything in the back, but I got two straps on my RC. So, uh, yeah, down in South Louisiana, you got to have, especially in the summertime, um, don't ever set up under a tree. All trees leak sap. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Gosh, yeah, good point. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> so then the question came from Lonnie, and you two might not have this answer, but let's try it out anyway. Um, there is a new tracker that came from Skywatcher. Um, it's a guided mount, 
And has anyone had any opinions or seen that and thought about? I know Alan Wallace put out a video on it, and probably Trevor from Astro Backyard. Everyone's been mentioning Astro Backyard. Yeah, he's awesome. I've been following yeah. him since 2016 and looking at how his channel's grown and seeing how my channel being a broad topic and his channel being a niche topic, how it just completely spiked and a great niche topic with Thieves Guy. So Trevor's been awesome and done really well. So have either of you thought about that guider? That uh, Yeah, go ahead, Blake. I was going to say, I don't know much about it. So. Oh, okay. Well, Skywatcher came out. Uh, Sky got, Iotron did their their stuff uh, pretty early on, and then everybody else came out. First, they came out with just trackers, and they weren't uh, equatorial. But the, the new ones are equatorial. And Sky Skywatcher, which is a great company, um, they got one in Europe and one here in the United States. Depending on if you go to Europe, you got one color. It's white in the United States, black in, in Europe. But oh, okay. They, uh, it's the same thing, but Skywatcher's trackers, uh, have come, they've, they've jumped up in the game. And they got a lot of good stuff that attached to the Sky got a pro, you have to kind of work and tinker with things to make things look good. Like the, I had to Velcro my pole master to it. Whereas, <laughs> Whereas the Skywatcher unit and I forget the other guy that's in it, um, they have pieces and parts that hook to them. But Trevor did a, he has a video out on all three of them that you can go and watch. And I've known Trevor since I started. He was the first person that I met. Uh, he had just started like a year before me. And uh, so we became good friends and shared stuff. And I love these videos, but he's got a great video on pretty much anything you want to find out. You yeah. can probably find a video from, from Trevor on filters, trackers, cameras, anything you want on it. Just go through his page. They're there. Yeah. So Chris Whiting asks, actually, first, I got to say, uh, Sean, Lonnie says, I want to be like Sean when I grow up. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Chris says, what is the most common focal length millimeter equivalent that you would shoot with? OTA, optical tube? assembly i think ota i'm a refractor nut i love my refractors uh, my rc is uh it's about 1600 i think i can't remember and i've got it reduced down to about 1200 but other than the rc all of my other telescopes are, are refractors and and so i kind of i love the 102 i have, i have a one i had a 127 from a sports scientific and I sold it, but I wish I had because yeah. it's a great scope. But I do have a 130, which is close enough. And then I had the, uh, the, the, the Red Cat, the so 75, 80, this is an 80. Um, and then the 102, that's my happy middle ground between wide field and getting a little deeper into your, your subject. So a 102 kind of fits the bill for everything. You get a little bit of everything in that scope. And I really love uh, Stellar View's got some beautiful scopes coming out right now, but you got to get on the waiting list to get them. But their 102, their, their equipment is incredible. I love Williams Optics. I've got, I've had so many of their scopes, but the fact is 102, then once you go down to the wide angle side, you're going to jump down into your 80s, your 70s, your 52 millimeters with the red cats. And then if you go the opposite direction, you're going to go up to the 127s, the 130s, and then you get up into the 152s, and you're a better person than me because you need about several thousands of dollars to get a good 152. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, you know, when I started thinking in 2014 that I was going to get into telescope photography, I spent a lot of time looking into what my – you know, gear choice would be, and how I was already up to like thirty thousand before I even really started thinking about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh no, I'll just buy that DSLR camera. How about that seventy uh, D from Canon? I'll try that instead. So then, I haven't had any new questions pop up. So while I'm waiting for people to have a question, I want to. I got to pose a comment, and Blake, you can vote on this. Sean, you can vote on this. Everyone else who's here, help me vote on this real quick thought. So. We had a plan to do a moment of envy with all of your panoramas, but Aaron's kind of unable to look at a calendar. He doesn't look at calendars very frequently, <laughs> and I, I didn't realize that the next week of Wednesday is already the week that I'm on the workshop. I knew I was leaving on Monday, but I didn't put two and two together that, you know, this week and next week, okay, it's over. So the question I have for you is I'd like to still do that live stream, but I can't do it on a Wednesday. I need to be driving on Monday, so does Sunday work for everybody? You guys want to 
do another Milky Way Wednesday completely on a different day and do a moment That's of envy. Me. Yeah. So then yeah. Sunday afternoon, is everyone thinking like a two o'clock mountain time or 7 p.m. mountain time? What's your vote, Blake? You're a Pacific timer. Is 6 p.m. the worst time? I would say 6 p.m. on Sunday would be great. So 7 p.m. So same time yeah, as Milky 7, Way Wednesday, but then it would be your 6 p.m., my 7 p.m. Yeah. It'd be like 9 p.m. for you out there in Louisiana. So yeah, that'd then, be tough for a Sunday night for me. So Sunday afternoon <laughs> would be better for Sean. Yeah, uh, I got to get up early for a meeting every Monday morning. Oh, gotcha. I'll be there either way. Ew, cool, cool, <laughs> awesome. So let's get some votes in the chat. As I know, it takes about 30 seconds for you to hear what I'm just talking about. So let's get some votes on when we can do it, that you can join me for it. We can still do that, and I will send out the link for it to everybody on the email list and everyone in the guild. You'll get the link, and I'll also add it to the description here and the description of previous Milky Way Wednesday videos so you can find the link. So if you're thinking, Aaron, I'm not in the guild. I'm not on your email list. How can I find that link? Just go to any video I've released the last couple weeks. I will put it at the top. Just a quick little bit.ly link that'll say, boom, then you go and you can submit your image and show me your best panorama image and I will pull up, you know, dozens of everyone's favorite so faster if you send me one i just want one lonnie i want one Rhonda, i want one blake i know you have many you can't show me any with lies in them so give me one of your best <laughs> <laughs> and so i'm getting sunday is fine sure sure sunday's great for me anytime works so all right i'm gonna let you choose sean 2 p.m your time so 12 no how about 4 p.m your time so that's, it's 2 p.m mine that's good yeah it's great yeah. okay awesome it'll be 2 p.m mountain time everybody so we'll do a moment of envy i'm going to feature your images and i'll hang out as long as i need to, to see everyone's stuff so you're going to send me one image and i will feature that okay so we gave it some time uh, but -ba bump Chris Whiting says, I have available to me a mead lxd 75 with an 8 inch scope can i start here what do you think? Is that a good it, piece of gear? I, I'm not sure what, what is that a refractor or is it a STC scope? Yeah, it's is a it, mead. Is it going to be a Schmidt Cassegrain automatically? Yeah. All the meads that I've seen have been Schmidt Cassegrain. Yeah, me too. So I'm assuming it's, it's going to be. It's, it's, it's tough to start with long uh, focal length scopes because uh, Blake brought up something that he glossed over in the beginning that probably went over past people, but wider angles if i had to choose if I, anybody came to me and said what scope should i start to learn with i'm going to tell you straight off the bat get the widest angle you can find because it's forgiving um you can make mistakes and it won't show up you know your, your, your guiding can be off a bit it's not going to show up but what you know what it's like to hold the lens on something a long lens and you're trying and it's moving around like this a little bit that's what it's like trying to guide with a long long uh, uh telescope so if you if you get a wide angle telescope for the big part of the sky it's way easier for that guiding system when you're learning about guiding and how to make all these pieces and parts work together uh, to get a wide angle scope and trevor jones will tell you the same thing i bet blake would probably tell you the same thing too uh, a wide angle scope is probably your greatest shot to success. I've seen a lot of people try to use a long scope like that and they quit because they they they're using blurry, they can't guide. It's it's hard. It's, it's you not you haven't done it long enough yet to figure out. But uh, not that you can't do it, but it's, it's, you're stacking the deck against you a lot more than you would be. Gotcha. So looking at the mead, Chris says that it's going to be a, an 800 millimeter equivalent F4. Any thoughts on that from those specs, Sean? Um, they do make a thing called Hyperstar, or uh, I'm not sure about that particular scope and how if, whether it's fast star uh, comparable or whatever, like compatible. You might want to check uh, with me and find out if you could put what that will do is it'll it'll turn your scope into an F2 and you can shoot super fast images and that will help you out. Oh, cool. Um, Hope it but, is compatible. Uh, yeah, like three second shots, 10 second shots, 15 second shots and, and pull off, you know, great images. You'll shoot a bunch of them, but you're going to you, be an F2. You, it's just, it's much, much more light coming in. But, uh, like I said, you, you're going to have to put either an off-axis guider or a guider on there, and guiding is difficult when you're trying to guide with, you know, like, it's like this, it took me a while to get my guiding under control because it's looking so far. It's going from this, you know, 
this on that and on this one it's this oh so, wow all right yeah. on all right cool well everybody say thanks to blake and sean for being with us tonight this is episode one of a deep sky roundtable as we will have claire and spencer back with another one i'll bring back blake and sean again as well as we'll just get into some more of these deeper as we go throughout the year i'll be gone for any live milky way wednesdays starting sunday i will be here for that sunday moment of envy and then we'll be gone for until august first week of august so it's going to be a while before another milky way wednesday steve says great show gotta go now not sure about sunday but we'll try sunday is father's day so i understand that it's gonna be tight for some people but you know hang out with me for 10 minutes while i talk about your image and if you only have 10 minutes you say aaron my name is chris whiting i'm going to leave soon can you look for chris whiting's picture (laughs) and it's like yes you got it chris i'll feature yours even if you're late today chris i'll still do that actually no yeah chris woodruff was here on time chris whiting was the one who was tardy as well as andrea and faster they all came in and apologized for being late and so no, no worries. You can always come whenever you want, everybody. Uh, James Baker, you can use a guy starter with a hyperstar. You can use – I think some of those autocorrect happened, James, so it's hard to tell what you exactly said, but you can use a guy start with a hyperstar. There you go. So I think these those terms might actually be correct. Bill Vincent says, with those big scopes, unless you have a big, accurate mount, deep sky is hard. Planetary is easier with a fast camera. Um, Lonnie says, awesome, Blake and Sean. Thank you so much. I added this so much, but Lonnie, I'm sure she's fine with that. Um, <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Looks like I don't have anything there. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Sean and Blake, for hanging out with me tonight. I know that it's been an hour and a half. That you've, actually, two hours since you were getting ready with me with tech beforehand so thanks for taking all this time you got redstickastro.com to thank sean and go there and be a part of it he will be starting his youtube channel soon we know that that's happening at the end of this year right sean yes 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 yes. (laughs) (laughs) and then blake uh your instagram is the fair what what is your instagram again fair image Fair image. So let me pull it up right now. I, Sean, you don't have an Instagram, right? I wasn't seeing it when I went. No, looking. it's there. I think it's under Red Stick Astro, or it's under my name. Oh, you know what? I did search up Sean Maloney first, and that's the problem. So I got fair image, and then I'm also gonna pull up Instagram of of Red Stick Astro. Of course, I should have tried Red Stick Astro. And help me out, Instagram. Find it. Do I need to put it all in one word? Red stick. I can pull it up. Yeah, probably. And there it is. I see Duke. So I know it's you. All right. There so. you go. Fa- it's on. Follow Red Stick Astro and give a good thanks to Sean for joining us tonight. Just go out to his Instagram and click, and you will get some inspiration to see some of the pictures that he has. I mean, and I'm happy to help anybody too. So if you contact me and you have questions or anything, I'm I'm, I'm always happy to help you because. God knows people helped me out when I was trying to learn this Isn't that true? That's how I feel about photography. When people ask yeah. me questions or ask me places, it's like, look, someone told me, so I'm going to tell you. I didn't right. invent any yeah. of this. I feel the same way. If anybody has any questions from a more beginner level, um, I'd be happy to help anybody. Awesome. You guys are really generous. Thanks so much for your time. You can see right below them, Red Stick Astro with Duke and Fair Image with Blake. Go ahead and go there and follow. I right now, okay, I won't quote any of the numbers right now, but if I don't see an extreme change, heads are going to roll. No, just kidding. <laughs> let's, let's see if we can get some more people following. All right. So it uh, looks like there's no new questions, no new comments. So thank you, everyone, for joining me tonight. Thanks for watching Milky Way Wednesday. You guys get out there. We just had a super moon. I believe it already happened last night, if I'm correct. I don't follow. Yeah, it was full last night. It was last night. <laughs> yeah, okay. I hate the moon. <laughs> I know. I hate the moon, too, so I don't even think about it. <laughs> but it's wonderful and good looking. But anyway, it's so you time. could have enjoyed that already. But here's coming now into the great time for our sky to be darker even longer and have milky way photography so get out there have some fun with your camera we'll see you all next on sunday and then i won't see you live for quite a while so thanks have a good summer see everybody take care